our laws as it pertains to substances are draconian and bizarre. The psychopaths start this way. He was an alcoholic. Because of social media and pornography, PTSD, love addiction, fentanyl and heroin, ridiculous <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a doctor for <laughs> sake. Where the hell you think I learned that? I'm just saying. You go to treatment before you kill people. I am a clinician. I observe things about these chemicals. Let's just deal with what's real. We used to get these calls on Loveline all the time. Educate adolescents and to prevent and to treat. If you have trouble, you can't stop and you want help stop it. I can help. I got a lot to say. I got a lot more to say. Here we are, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, very strange day. I, I think you all know why with the Kobe Bryant story, but I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, again, all the usual shows and podcasts are at drdrew.com. Don't forget After Dark. And do sign up for this show at drdrew.tv. We'll send you out a blast when we are about to go live with this. And um, we're going to keep trying to do those daily doses. I don't know if you guys have uh, been a part of that, but we, our producer, Ms. Pinsky, gets in there, and we try to do a daily dose where we – Go straight to camera. I don't have calls on that show. We have sort of the restream or wherever you are, we can follow your stream and uh, answer your questions. Again, I'm going to be on the road next week, so it might be a little bit spotty, and we apologize for that, but we will be around. And uh, I don't know. I don't, and Susan, I don't think we can do this show next week, which you guys don't want it anyway because it's Super Bowl Sunday, but we'll try to do some sort of a daily dose at that time. Uh, today's sponsor are Social CBD and NeedleDestructionDevice.com, and we'll get you more about that at the break. I'm extremely happy about that needle destruction device because um, sheriff departments and hopefully hospitals are starting to use this and we are going to have a, a major, major breakthrough in terms of limiting needle sticks and all that goes with that. Here with me today is George Papadopoulos. His book is Deep State. There it is. Uh, Deep State Target. I bigger, there he is. Hi, George. Uh, the How I Got Caught in the Crosshairs of the Plot to Bring Down President Trump. Before we're going to get into the book with George, we're going to have his wife, Simona Mangiante, in here. We're going to take your calls. But before we get into this, I, I can't not talk about the Kobe Bryant story. I mean, uh, we'll, we'll visit it here a few times during the show. Um, I think most people are aware he died today in a helicopter accident with one of his daughters. We are hearing nine people died. That's now confirmed that we don't know who is amongst those nine. I have my own Kobe story. I'm going to tell that story as we go along here. Is that what you're nodding your head about, Miss Producer? Yes, she wants to hear the Colby story, and it's a great story. I spent a, quite a bit of time on the phone with him. Uh, whatever you hear about him being a great guy, I, I'm, I, it's not just in his absence that I would say this. I had nothing but an extraordinary experience with him, a bright, just a great guy. And so we'll try to um, visit his memory here. But, George, thank you for joining me. Appreciate thank you so being much. We got to meet your wife, and she's going to yeah, be back. And that's right. You guys went to Italy. We tried to get you in here, but you're touring the world. <laughs> and you were touring it right as a Russian operative, right? You were you were there on behalf of Russia. Is that what happened? Or were Ukraine? Which one? Well, I was, so, a, I, I guess, a lot of different countries. I was a, some so, sort of operative for at least five different countries. Is, is that what they're on, claiming in this? Depending that, on which uh, news cycle you're following or wow. which headline you're reading. Well, I got to say, they, they cast you both well, particularly your wife. If I had to cast she a did. Russian <laughs> operative, I'm like, that. Simone, she's got the role. <laughs> so she ought to, maybe you ought to talk to a casting director because if there are roles for, for a, a female spy, she, she's got it. The problem with the country today, and I want to get right at this, we have this obsession with narratives. That's right. It's, I've never seen anything like it. Facts aren't the issue. Persuasion has become sort of the, the means whereby people are moved these days rather than logic and persuasion. But one of the side effects of all this is a narrative emerges, and if the narrative sounds good or satisfies some tribal instincts, they cling to it, and that's it. That's just the truth. And I think that's what you got caught in. That's absolutely correct. Uh, what we saw for the last two years were essentially these this ironclad ideology almost where people were following it blindly where the president was a Russian asset. His mem members of his campaign were conspiring with the Russian government. This was ironclad. It was infallible. We couldn't uh, basically uh, abdicate from that particular truth. Which narrative. Was, it's a that, narrative. That, that narrative, narrative yeah. whatever you wanted to. Well, I remember seeing, I saw footage of, uh, not Clapper, but uh, what's his name? Uh, what, who does he used to do the morning show? Now he's at his own show. Anyways, he was saying, a day in infamy, we now have a Russian operative in the White, in the Oval Office. I thought, you're... You're saying that as a reporter reporting the facts. It's too much. It's too much. Well, I think Cuomo. It was Cuomo. It, I saw him do it. It was Cuomo, and it actually it should really act as a harbinger, I guess, for the future. For you know, journalists not really rushing into establishing narratives without 
a basis rooted in logic and facts, or else what's going to happen is their journalists are going to be left with egg on their face, like a lot of these journalists are today, and I think they're pretty are upset. Are they? Do you think the journalists give a damn? You know what? Did you get apologies from them? Did they fall on their swords? Is there a lead article in any one of their journals that says, George, I'm sorry? You know, not all of them, but uh, and, and actually nothing personal to me or even some of the other people uh, who were caught up in this uh, incredible story. But um, I was watching CNN, and I have nothing against CNN. Actually, I've had I worked at CNN. I've had I've had wonderful interviews on yeah. CNN, and actually, my first interview where I started to speak about my story with my wife was with Jake Tapper. And Jake Tapper himself, just last week or so, actually started to come out a bit and say, "Look, we were basically a little bit fooled here, and uh, this shouldn't happen again. And we're actually going to be digging into facts with a lot more scrutiny." I am forward. glad to hear him. So say that. I was very happy to see that because, um, you know, their reputation is at stake here. Well, their ratings are way down. But 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 you said the journalists. You you opened with saying the journalists have to watch their narratives, or they will end up with egg on their face. But but it's, it's this. It's this. The internet that they're trying to. Keep keep up with and all the nonsense that shows up on your social media <laughs> feed that gets the eyes that they're competing with right and well, so that's what motivates them to do this well twitter really has become an incredible platform i mean twitter uh and my wife actually going on tv before i could actually speak because you were in prison i was on the way to, on the way to those prison. 11 uh horrendous uh, <laughs> nights for something that we now realize was um corrupt at its core and that's not me saying it the department of justice just a couple days ago uh, deemed that these warrants and all this surveillance against us was illegal so this was a very uh, dark moment i think in american history i hope that uh we as a nation do heal and come together moving forward is this and, what's motivating you to run for congress that's actually the main reason i am running for congress because uh, when i go around the country not just in california but in florida illinois new york and i speak at these major i don't want to call them rallies but uh, in conferences events yeah. events there's one question that people always ask me is, would you consider running for Congress? This is before I considered running for Congress, because we need somebody to hold people accountable. We understand if you run as a Republican or as a Democrat or as a moderate, you're they going to- They don't care anymore. They don't care. They want, they want a sane, healthy- person who serves the people that's exactly that's right what they want they and, don't want those political theater and and answer get, i'm getting the same thing i see it i and, see and, it and i i had the i made the huge mistake of going you know i live in shifts district maybe i should and that became he or he's going and people started wanting to donate to to no campaign i'm not running i've said it and said it and said it. i'm not running <laughs> not right now anyway when george wins i'll visit him see how he likes it and then maybe then <laughs> california so, needs us so where where are you running what district? so we're running in the 25th congressional district it's the district that uh, katie hill recently uh, resigned from the, it was a national story as you uh, probably well remember um i've been pretty uh, vocal about that i'm not sure exactly why she actually resigned if it just had to do with this revenge porn case because I think uh, it doesn't matter if you're on the right or the left. Uh, what happened to her was... Uh, not okay. Not okay. I, I think she was pushed out. Something else was going on. Yeah, but but I think she... But she kind of put the blame on... Uh, I, other than the people I think pushed her out, which was her her left, the left. Yeah. I think I think the Nancy Pelosi's and whatever just said, we can't deal with this right now. You got to go. That's exactly what I think happened. She resigned very quickly, and there was there were obviously other rumors that she was uh, there was some malfeasance going on behind the scenes in her office besides simply the sex scandal. So, so you think there's something else there also? I believe so mm -hmm. because uh, when somebody raises six point five million dollars to win a congressional seat that was historically Republican, as she did at a relatively young age, I think she's uh, around my age, thirty one, thirty two. Mm -hmm. And then to resign without even fulfilling one term, mm -hmm. uh, there's something else going on there. Interesting. Well, uh, she didn't show good judgment. I will give her that. And I agree with you. I think she was, uh, the, the, the way it was uh, put to her was not okay. It was not okay. I didn't like that at all. Yeah, because... And, and unfortunately, when she spoke at her resignation, I thought she spoke beautifully, by the way, she laid the blame in the wrong place, even though the issue I thought was just was right. It's not okay. Yeah, I and I and I think you know, of course, she's a Democrat. She's going to be against uh, Donald Trump, and you know, unfortunately, that's actually a symptom of the system. I and and this is why in my campaign, we're not taking lobbyist money, we're mm -hmm. not taking PAC money. All of our money is grassroots, small donors, individual donors. We just crossed right. twenty five hundred individual donors, and we've almost raised as much money as Steve Knight, who was a previous congressman in that district. And the reason I'm mentioning this is because. 
I don't know who Katie Hill was actually talking for when she was resigning. Was it the small donors? Was it her constituents? Or was it the super PACs and the lobbyists who or, gave her the six point five million? Right, right. I don't and know. and it and it distorts her message. I yeah. mean, uh, you mentioned she spoke beautifully, but she put the blame and she apportioned the I, blame to the wrong people. I agree with you. And part, that's what I thought. Yeah. We have a call. I don't know what this means. I hope I'm not getting anything uh, off track here, but it's for you. And let's go ahead and take it. This is uh, Richard, who's watching us up in Montreal. Richard, do you have a question for George? Yes. Hi, George. Thank you for everything what you do, by the way. And I read, I bought your book. I read it. It was very informative. Um, I'd like to know: Is John Dur- has John Durham interviewed you? Because if he hasn't interviewed you, a George lot of people don't second, believe Richard, it's Richard, a serious one, investigation. Richard, hold on okay. a second, buddy. George isn't hearing you for some reason. Okay. Is that correct? You're yeah, not no, I don't hear anything. No. Okay, he he. I'll, I'm going to translate for you, Richard, until we fix that technical problem. Uh, he loved your book. Oh, great! But great. he wants to know: Are you still speaking to John Durham or doing an interview with him? Oh. So I, I can't speak about my interactions with um, regarding an ongoing criminal investigation. Is that into you or is that into their behavior? It's into, not into my behavior, into the, it's into the behavior of the investigators looking into myself and Donald Trump and right. others. everybody else that got ensnared. So, so, I mean, just so people can understand what's happening here, the John Durham probe and the Horowitz report that just came out was looking into the conduct of the FBI and the other intel agencies re- against the Donald Trump campaign. We're going to switch headsets on oh. you so you can yep. hear you can hear Richard when we get him back on the line here. Okay. So the behavior of the yeah. the behavior of the of the uh, intelligence community essentially. Is it okay if I Yeah, yeah just you're, we're right ahead. Put, move on. Pay no attention. Oh, now I hear. It. There you go. So the the behavior of the intelligence community. Yes. Yeah, keep going. Yes. So the Durham probe that's ramping up over the last uh, let's say 4 or 5 months uh, is looking into the illegal criminal behavior of both the CIA and the FBI and high level of Obama administration officials let, targeting let, the let campaign. Let me let me ask this. Is if they really believe their narrative, they had an obligation to do some of the stuff they were doing, right? E- even though the means whereby they came to that narrative was I don't have a good word for it. It was uh, astonishing. Uh, but once they convinced themselves, they really had an obligation to be very aggressive, right? It's one thing if you have a theory to look into if there's probable cause for a yeah. crime. In this case, we just, for, based on the news we had a couple of days ago, there was no probable cause. That's why these warrants were illegal. Yeah. It's another issue, and that's what I believe the John Durham probe is looking into, is the manufacturing of fake evidence to therefore target American Got citizens. It. Got it. And uh, that's, that's what I think uh, Durham is looking into and why uh, a lot of these people have lawyered up. Richard, does that uh, get, get your question answered? Yeah, the reason why I'm asking is when John Huber was appointed to look into Uranium One, John Huber never even interviewed the informant, the main informant who had all the information. So that's why I'm asking George if John Durham has interviewed him, because if he hasn't, then it's another investigation that the American people don't believe in. It means that's just basically running out the clock on President Trump just to get to the next election, to make like they're looking they're doing something, but they're not, because John Huber did nothing. Let he didn't even interview the informant, Mr. Campbell. Richard, let me ask you, you're, you're, you're in Montreal. How do you, why do you have this uh, level of interest in the, the political intrigue in the United States? Are you American? Uh, no, I'm not an American, but I, what goes on in the United States is very important. I think it's, it, it won't be good for the world if the Democrats come into power in 2020 after with their policies on immigration and well, sympathy for the Iranian government and Iran. It's just, I, I just hope President Trump wins, but people have to be held accountable what they did to George, what they did to General Flynn, what they did to the president, what they did to this country. So that's why I'm asking if, if George it. was just at least interviewed by John Durham because John Huber didn't even interview the informant for, for Uranium One. Thank you, Richard. I'm sure he understands what I mean. The, I'll let George, okay. Let's let George answer that. Go ahead, George. So I, I, as I mentioned, I can't uh, delve into details regarding an ongoing criminal investigation because John Durham's investigation is not simply an administrative review. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is an ongoing criminal investigation looking into uh, the activities of the CIA, foreign governments, including Ukraine, Italy, Australia, the UK, and uh, high-level Obama State Department figures. So uh, while the Mueller probe was looking into... I mean, we could all we all understand it was all fantasy. Um, this criminal investigation is looking into real substantive issues and real people. That my book, if you've read my book, 
uh, you could kind of see it coming to life almost uh, weekly. Anytime there's new headlines regarding where this investigation is going, an individual from my book is in on a in headline. It. So I cannot comment just to summarize on whether I've been interviewed or not, but I can say that I did testify behind uh, closed doors to the House Oversight Committee about a year and a half ago, and that was around the time when the Durham probe launched. Uh, so I'll leave it at that for now. Are you angry with all this? I can't imagine how you could not be frustrated and angry, the helplessness you must have felt when this was going on. I, I felt angry for uh, the, what our country went through mm. because it's not really just about myself or even President Trump or Paul Manafort or Michael Flynn. This is really all about the trust that we as Americans hold in institutions that we are supposed to revere. It's about the rule of law. It's about uh, justice, accountability, and uh, trust. And if everyday Americans look at the news and see that the FBI or the CIA was plotting, I don't want to call it a coup, but you know that's a word that's been used a lot. What? How can an everyday American, an average Joe out there, or or uh, you know a working class family? Um, feel comfortable around law enforcement moving forward. Well, so I think not, that's a long, the, the deleterious long term. Not effect. just law enforcement. I I feel like I, as as a physician, I know if there is a malpractice action, they can find a problem with something I did. They they you can always find an I that isn't dotted or a T that's not crossed. It's not but the letter of what you're supposed to do where some liability incurs. And I as a citizen of the United States feel like. If, if, I think that's my camera, right? Yes. Uh, if the United States, if the feds come after me for anything, they will find something. They will find a way to catch me in something. That's their goal. They don't care about the truth. They care about catching me in something. What do they catch you in? Well, uh, I don't like to quote um, ma maniacal uh, genocide dictators like Stalin, but <laughs> Stalin actually uh, said something very similar to what you just expressed. And he said, show me the man and I will find the crime. Right. Okay, this is yes. Stalin, yes. who just basically uh, said exactly what you just uh, stated. That is exactly. And, and I understand bureaucracies are set up that way, but ours was not supposed to be. <laughs> Look, in, in my in my situation, what happened was there was a lying charge. It was uh, There was a very chaotic moment where I'm interviewed with the FBI, and after my 302s were just declassified. What's it, a 302? A 302 basically is the summary that the FBI writes up after an interview. Got they it. had at least uh, 20 of those from the various people they interviewed. <clears throat> and in my case, they basically said, he didn't lie to us. Um, he actually was trying to help us. And then when I didn't want to wear a wire against one of these people that apparently is at the core of the entire scandal, Joseph Mifsud. This, uh, That's who, your wife's boss or <laughs> partner or whatever he was. I, I heard the name, but I don't quite understand what the thing it, was. It, it's, it's an incredible... That's how she got hooked into it, too. She got hooked into it. There, that's why there was a lot of a curiosity about her as well as her connections to politics in Europe. It's a, it's an incredible story of actually how we even met. So, so, so Mifsud, you were supposed to wear a wire and go in there. Would that have been dangerous? Well, think of it this way. I, 48 hours before this offer, I tell the FBI everything I know about this individual who I had not seen for nine months. Mm. And I tell them, why would I wear a wire about against somebody I haven't seen, I have no real relationship with, and I told you everything I know about him, and you're the professionals here. And we actually saw it in the transcript, because I guess most of my interview with uh, these gentlemen was being transcribed, and it was just recently released due to a BuzzFeed uh, lawsuit. And I tell them I have nothing to do with it, and then after that... There's actually more surveillance on me. They were never looking for my help, it seems like. They just wanted to get me to uh, create this narrative that George Papadopoulos, this guy in these black sunglasses wearing a suit and tie. Oh, yeah. You guys, you got to stop looking like a spy, <laughs> both of you. <laughs> Will you stop looking so Italian? <laughs> but, but, it, but, but <laughs> I mean, I mean, do you remember when my name first came out? It was constantly the one picture with me with the sunglasses. Yeah, it's and this one. It's yeah. this picture. It's this picture. <laughs> That's him as the spy. It, it, this looks like, this has looked like the little vignettes you see in Mob Wife. <laughs> right so i mean so by crafting the narrative what do you do you get this younger guy you know dressed in the suit and tie right outside harrods in london with a briefcase and uh sunglasses oh, and constantly i'm in he is talking to a, Let's write a movie agent. you should write a movie it's, uh, you should write a movie uh, about this <laughs> <laughs> and there should be a question there whether you're really a spar or not we are we are in holly weird uh, dr drew so, <laughs> so who knows I, well, I think I'm going to get on that because it's, it's too good. It's too crazy. 
And so, so you it somehow there you say something or you have two inconsistent responses and one of the two or threes or something is that what happened? And, and apparently, because uh, what they got me on was because I said, "Oh, I met him before I joined the Trump campaign," but I really met him when I joined the Trump campaign. They said this was a material lie; it affected U.S. national security. So because of that, we had to violently so, 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 arrest him at an airport. So, so you mistimed yes. your original contact with Mifsud. Yes. It was. Was it before or at the time of the Trump, uh, you were working for the Trump? What were you doing for Trump? So uh, so basically, my, my career was one of these linear type of careers as a young analyst in D.C. I worked in D.C. for five years before I got into uh, presidential campaign politics. Uh, I worked at a conservative think tank called the Hudson Institute. Which uh, is a conservative think tank. Yeah, okay. some of my so. uh, you know colleagues over there were people who were running the Pentagon and the White House under Bush and Reagan. Uh, Scooter Libby, who was obviously the chief of staff of uh, Dick Cheney, and Douglas Fyth, uh, who was uh, running the Pentagon under Rumsfeld. So I had those bona fides. I ended up joining Ben Carson's campaign and Donald Trump's campaign as a foreign policy advisor. I, I'm a huge Ben Carson fan. Great guy. Great I, guy. Great guy. He, we got to teach him how to speak publicly. <laughs> that's, I, that's his only weakness. He doesn't come across... On TV and at the podium, the way he we I know him to be, you well, know. Well, and that's part of politics. It's not yeah, what yeah. you say; it's how you say it. And yeah. optics really matters, and optics are reality. So I, I agree. He's a very cerebral. Uh, obviously, he's a neuro uh, scientist. Yeah, I, I I've been working on the homeless thing diligently, and and I've had to have some medical conversations with him. And you know, when you when you're a resident, you're on call overnight, and when and you've been up all night at six in the morning, you hand off to other doctors and you give them a report. The morning you go, here's this case, and it's all very shorthand because you want to, you need to give them the basics and let them take over, and you go to bed. And uh, he and I had that kind of exchange, and I felt like he was he was just a Hoover. He was just sucking up everything I said. He got it. He got it. He got it. He got it. Guys, guys brilliant and uh and i just thought to myself oh we got to get him speaking better at the podium because that's where his weakness is that's it and as secretary of hud he's dealing with the homeless issue and oh housing. he's coming in he's gonna take a he, I, I have faith that man's gonna something's gonna happen yeah soon. i saw those uh pictures of with you at the white house and yeah, i'm sure you were talking to uh, that's why i spent the afternoon with it was him it, him and azar a, both amazing people and so secretary azar is the hhs and secretary carson is a hud and and uh, that stuff I'm worried about is people and housing and drug medication and medical man, you know, medical uh, uh, the medical system. And uh, those two guys are good guys to have in charge. Humbly, this so. really is a an uh, it's really a, a horrible horrible situation we're living in here in California. I mean, I, I've had the privilege to make California home just for the last year and a half. We're going on two years with my wife. But it doesn't take somebody who was born and raised in California to look around and to see that there is a major, major homeless issue. And there's a drug problem. There's a mental health crisis that reverberates throughout not only my district, but the entire state. The, the state. I, I was up in Sacramento and I gave a talk. I was angry. I noticed I'm yelling a lot on the footage we have here at the beginning. Then I was yelling about the opiate crisis. That's what was getting me crazy. Yeah. And finally... It was actually Jeff Sessions that really took care of that. People don't understand. I Because I was at that opiate conference and Session goes, you know, I'm going to take care of this. I'm going to go get these overprescribers. And the way my profession is, when you start get, getting doctors criminally for anything, we freeze. We stop doing everything and just won't do whatever that thing was. We're all, we all just sort of stay away from it. And that's what changed it. Now, so the prescribing went all the way. You're, you're going to see data that goes all the way down. But the heroin and the fentanyl went up. Right, because we abandoned these patients that we had created as addicts, and in this state, we've made through Prop 47, Prop 57, is essentially legal to use in traffic drugs and to steal to support it. So they come, they come by the tens of thousands, and that's exactly why I think immigration and the wall. Uh, it's not just simply about um, uh, p- p- preventing well, unvetted migrants from around the, ro- the world to come through, but yeah. it's about these illicit drugs that are, uh, you know, permeating through the border and uh, well, reaching I, the California. I guess that's where it's coming from. It's probably true, but but our, the the bigger problem, the interesting thing in relation to the immigration crisis is, so we are a sanctuary state here, and yeah. we welcome people in. This city, the city of Los Angeles, has absorbed conservatively 1.5 million undocumented workers. They're not on the street. They found housing. Where's the housing crisis? One and a half million people without a job, without a passport, without a family, without anything managed to find housing. How the hell is our homeless problem a housing problem? Give me a break. It's insulting for them to maintain that position. Yes, we need environments of care. We need more psychiatric facilities, and they can be community-based, they can be vocational rehab, and they can be, you know, very rural. Look at look at the, the big model people are finally talking about is um, 
in San Antonio, Haven Haven House. Yeah. And it's great. And Marbut, the guy who is in charge of Homeless for the White House, ran it for 20 years or something. So good. Let's go do that. Don't give me any BS about housing. We, we, we do need low-income housing. Don't get me wrong. We do need that in this state. And I wish we did a better job of it the way New York does. New York says if you're going to build a building, 20% is low-income housing. And that's that. Good. Let's do something like that. But don't even think it's going to have anything to do with the homeless. Nothing. So what is it like in the district where you're uh, running? Oh, let me just also say, say real quick before we do, I, I'm watching the restream. I'm watching your guys' comments on Facebook and Twitter and elsewhere. And um, the Kobe thing is catching, you know, people's, um, of course, attention and emotions. I, I will be happy to address it as we go along here. Those of you who have not heard, I don't, I, I'm mortified to be the one to report that Kobe Bryant has died this morning in a helicopter accident, along with eight other people, one of whom for sure was his daughter. We don't know whom else was on the plane. So, um, you know, we'll keep giving you updates as we as we have them, and I'll let you finish, and then, then I'll tell my Kobe story. So, uh, what's going on in your in your district? So, in my my district is a middle class district. Uh, we just opened up our uh, campaign office in Simi Valley. There's been tremendous support. People understand that I'm not from California originally, and we've we're recently were transplants here, so that's not an issue. Because, like I said, we've raised almost as much money as my competitor Steve Knight who was the former congressman, and he's dealing with PACs and a lot of money from... Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he was recently endorsed by uh, Kevin McCarthy, who was uh, the House Minority Leader himself. So There's a Kevin McCarthy and there's a Kevin McCarthy, right? In the, in the, in the state Senate? In the state uh, in the, legislature? In the state legislature. This is the congressman. And, uh, oh, I see. Yeah, okay, McCarthy, right. McCarthy. There's McCarthy yeah. in, the Senate, in the state legislature, and McCarthy is, McCarthy, is, yeah. is federal. McCarthy. Got yeah. it, got it, got it. And, and I noticed that there's... People yearn for me to be in the district. That's one thing that they constantly say to me. We want you here. We want to just shake your hand. We want to meet you on a face-to-face, -face, personal basis and just hear what you have to say. That's what nice. are your prescriptions for our social, economic, and uh, political woos? How are you going to deal with the administration? Are you going to be a pro-Trump, uh, uh, pro-administration congressman? Are you going to be a rhino? Are you going to What's be a rhino? Mon a rhino is a Republican in name only. Oh. And that's a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a term that I I think I want to be a dino. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, you could also be a Kennedy Democrat, and uh, you know Kennedy I, was for uh, I, he was anti-abortion, he was pro-gun, and uh, I, I think I'm a Clinton Democrat, really. I mean, a Bill Clinton Democrat. I think that's sort of my thing. Well, and, and I don't believe in, in in individuals having to recoil to the extremes of any position. Yeah. And in this um, era that we're living in, the left is extreme left. There is real no it's center weird. ground. I, yeah, but I, don't you feel like most people that are not on the media are not speaking up in congress are in the middle ground most most americans sort of want that middle ground at least at least non <laughs> depends where you are right i mean obviously in new york city it's probably pretty polarized but most of the country most people are kind of in the middle they just want a government that serves our needs exactly i think people uh, and what's government's duty to protect everyday uh, citizens security and livelihoods right and yes. as long as we're doing that doesn't matter if you're on the right or the left that's what people are going to vote in and unfortunately, I think the Democrats today just do not have a winning platform. They've gone too far to the left. People like Bernie Sanders are going on national television trying to articulate a policy in which they know, have no idea how they're going to actually pay for it. How is Elizabeth Warren going to provide Medicare for all? Are you going to raise $50 trillion in well, new taxes? Well, she was going to have a 1% wealth tax, and I'm just going to pay it that way. I, I don't people people don't because people don't understand compounding they don't understand negative compounding exactly that is going to really erode this country's uh, economic well-being exactly um, more importantly there's a, a couple of people online here I'm watching the stream I uh, want to know did we coordinate our outfits much more important <laughs> so so that's that's more important for today no we did not but we have maybe the same wife who got in our case so so here's a, here's somebody wants to ask a very specific question it's actually directed at me but I want to hear your response to it uh, David go ahead Hey, what's up, Dr. Drew? Hi, Dave. What's going on? Hey, uh, I, I heard that you may run against Adam Schiff for Let's see. I may Congress. <laughs> do it. No, I'm not running. Yeah, right? Thank you for saying dude. so, but I'm not running. But go ahead. Oh, you're not? Oh, man, you should, dude. <laughs> Come on, man. We, I'm, we, L.A. loves you, man. You've been here with us. I from have. I, back Dave, way in the day. I know. Way in the day. You and all that, man. You're right, David. David, you're so right, and it's and you are not alone. I've had many people implore me to do it. Uh, it's it's a deep honor to have some. It's a very extraordinary thing when people say, I, "What you know, Dave?" What I realized is yeah. how we Americans cherish our vote. 
I mean, when people come up to you and say, you have my vote, they do it in a way that I, it almost feels like a religious communion. Like this is something really important and I'm offering it to you. It was deeply moving to have many people do that and then offer money to help and blah, blah, blah. And so it was and it, with ambivalence, and maybe that's why the story keeps going, that I said, I'm not running now. My, my family's not ready for it. I'm not ready for it. But I do feel, uh, David, okay, hang on, buddy. Okay. Wait, hold on. I do feel like I have to do yeah. something. I feel like I have to do something, just the way you do. I, like I do too, man. I do too because, you know what, Dr. Drew? I've lived in L.A. 50 years, and I've never seen it this bad. No, it's ever. never. It's never been like it this. It is hey, horrible. Hey, yeah. Listen, it's never been like this. I, I mean, you'd have to go to 11th century Westminster to find this. You know what I mean? Or, the bubonic uh, plague. I, it's coming. Uh, believe me, we now we that coronavirus. If that gets in the homeless, forget it, forget yeah. it, guys, forget it. Yeah, dude, it's terrible. And you know, I live right here by Marina Del Rey, and they and the homeless are all over. They're all over the freeway in the bushes. I mean, it's ridiculous, man. Ridiculous. It's uh, it's it's just, it's just it just drives me crazy, man. And I wanted to ask you because I thought you were going to run. But go ahead. I was going to ask you about Please. what would your response? What would your response hit be? Or what would you support? Uh, in fact, that I, I read today that uh, Iran hit us with three missiles at our embassy in Iraq today, and yeah. I was wondering, like, you know, if you're yeah. going to run, I want to know, like, what would your position be okay. on that? Let, let, let me let me tell you, he, 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 I am not one to go. We created this mess. We got into this. All that goes without saying. We created this mess. We did. We did. But unfortunately, because we created, we also have to finish it. That would be my sort of basic policy. And I would, I will, I'll hear what you have to say, George, but my position would be, I'd go to the professionals. What, what do the, what do, not, not to saying blindly listen to the military people, but I would go to the professionals, what, what do you recommend? What are my options? What do you, what do you think is the right thing to do here? Give me, and I, I got to tell you, when, when I was uh, teaching medical students and residents, I always told them, I don't care, you defend your position, defend your decision, tell me what you want to do and why, but you're going to be wrong. You're going to be wrong a lot of the time. And I will not hold you accountable for that. I'm going to hold you accountable for the plan you have if you are wrong. And if you don't have a plan to be wrong, I will crucify you because somebody will die. And I feel the same way about military planning. Exactly. You do need to talk to the experts, and those are the generals on the ground and the troops on the ground. But what I really think is happening today with Iran, this is saber-rattling. I mean, we've been dealing with Iran and the saber-rattling since 79. Uh, we just took out the number two person in the entire country, Soleimani. I will make the argument that this was a premeditated strike with intense collaboration among the great powers in the region, including Israel, Russia, Iran, Turkey, Saudi, Saudi. I think there was a death wish on Soleimani himself. I think what's happening today in the Middle East, it harkens back to centuries ago about the balance of powers. I think people are happy with how things have ended up in the Middle East today. The Russians have protected their naval installation in Syria. U.S. troops are in Syria and Iraq. Turkey has its own troops in the north, and uh, and Israel, as in their greater frontier, is defended against a very weakened Syrian military force. So Soleimani, on the other hand, was trying to upend this somewhat stable situation by instigating attacks on the U.S. embassy, uh, uh, financing insurrections around the Middle East and North Africa. I mean, let's not forget, he was responsible for the death of Christopher Stevens, Ambassador Christopher Stevens in, in Libya. So... There probably was a death wish on this guy. Uh, of course, Iran was going to have a symbolic strike against America for what happened, just to save face. And that's exactly what I think this is. So I don't think we need to up the... Um, no, I, the, yeah. We don't need to amplify... Heat it up. We don't, don't need to, to heat, heat anything up. up yeah. Let things cool off. Yeah, I would it's agree It's all about saving that. face right now. Yeah. Uh, and, I, and I think it, it seems like... I mean, I noticed... You never know what Trump is thinking, but he was sort of reaching out to the Iranian people, and, and yeah. we—and that's, I think, the right approach, which is it's—it's it's that government that the many of the people we think a majority, sixty percent, and we have a problem with. And by the way, if they would just keep to themselves, or no, I mean, what, they, we wouldn't have a problem with them. But it's the saber rattling that apparently was this guy's thing, Suleimani. Anyway, uh, I don't know enough about that to really comment. I—I I, I really don't, and I, I feel like a not even a dilettante. Uh, uh, let's go to some more calls if I can get it. Uh, oh my goodness, uh, these are hard calls. Let me let me revisit before I go to some of these calls the Kobe Bryant story, if you guys don't mind, uh, very quickly. Which is, uh, I, if anybody's just coming onto this show, Kobe Bryant died this morning in a helicopter accident. It uh, 
persuaded me I'm not going to be riding in helicopters, although I was very fascinated with the idea of doing so. I've now dropped that as even something I'm contemplating doing. Uh, his daughter was with him as well as uh, seven other people beyond he and his daughter. It's a tragedy. Uh, Los Angeles, if those of you around the country don't know, people are in the streets, not not demonstrate. They're in the streets sharing, communing, mourning out around Staples, around, you know, where, of course, you know, his... his uh, legendary career and where he lived part of the time as well down in that part of los angeles people are feeling really it's hard to process i gotta tell you if you're a los angelian so my story with kobe uh although i although i was there when they won the first uh championship the nba championship i was there that night but later uh my wife susan and i were somebody gave us courtside seats which if you ever have an opportunity to take courtside seats i'm suggesting you don't you better. You're more like you're. You're better off trying heroin because because it's such an extraordinary experience that you will never. You'll have trouble watching basketball again. But we were there, uh, and it was the Raptors before they were a, a powerhouse, and the Lakers. The Raptors were sort of coming on then, and uh, and the Lakers were behind. Uh, there was like five seconds left in the game. Side out Lakers. We were directly across the court from the Laker bench. And, um, you know, the you know, buzzer rah, rings and they all start walking down the court. There's five seconds left. They're down by two. And uh, Kobe is walking coolly as he always does, you know. And he starts walking towards our end of the of the uh, the sidelines where we're sitting right there on court level. And he does one of these. Like, like uh, <laughs> give, give me that give me that camera. Because I have to do it. Yeah, because he one of these, like, right at me. And I'm like... <laughs> I'm literally, I'm like, what? whoa, I know he's looking over here, but it couldn't be me. Mrs. Pinsky, because it's only two seconds left, is doing this. She's in the inner seat like this. And and he just keeps walking towards me. And I thought, oh, there's got to be somebody behind me that he's, he's talking to. And he got about 15, 15 yards away, maybe 10 yards away. And he just goes, a couple more of these, and he goes, hey, we need to chit-chat about uh, Jody Arias. Oh. Apparently, the Laker locker room played the Jody Arias trial continuously. They were preoccupied <laughs> with it, and I had an HLN program where we yeah. covered this story, you know, back to back. And he and he, so here's this is the real beat of the story. He goes, "We need to chit chat about Jody Arias." Turns, gets the ball, drives the baseline, boom, tie game. They end up winning the game. It was the coolest thing I've ever seen any human do. That's Kobe Bryant. And and by the way, he was as good as his word. He called me, and we chit-chatted about Jody Harris for about an hour or so. And they could not have been a brighter, kinder, more engaging human being than, than Kobe Kobe Bryant. And and wow. we, he will be missed. This is a tragedy. It makes me emotional thinking about it. And uh, we in Los Angeles especially are just, ugh. And if, if more than, you know, I, I really my heart now is with the mom who I don't know how she lives, goes on living. Uh, I'm sure she has tons of support, but it's just such a massive loss for her. Okay. That said, uh, uh, this is interesting. I, I got a bunch of kind of interesting things. Let me, let me do this. This is uh, Chris. Sorry, Chris. Hey, Chris, you have a kind of interesting question right. there. Go ahead. Oh, great. Well, I was on your show a couple of weeks ago. My father founded the Pritikin Longevity Center. Oh, yeah. He was a yeah, yeah. founding director. Thank you. I remember and that. so this line, this line of thinking that I've been looking into over the last 20 years is that our leaders are traumatized, and it's in a book called The Politics of Denial. Mm -hmm. And so they have psychic numbing and so they can't feel the suffering of the people. Well, uh, who I was talking to somebody, Chris, about... Oh, I was talking to James Fallon last week, who's a, a neuroscientist, and uh, he's an expert in psychopathy and, to some extent, narcissism. And we were talking about the personality profiles of presidents throughout the history of this country. And uh, they are... Uh, I, I don't want to sound pejorative. Let's just say they weren't average. There's no president that has an average personality structure in the history of our country. And uh, trauma, yeah, trauma could be part of what sets it up. Uh, I mean, there can be lots of other things. And it may not even be just psychic numbing. It may be disconnect, either narcissistic disconnect or psychopathic disconnect, where they really don't feel feelings in a meaningful way. But to be fair, I mean, I don't know how you feel. It's kind of a heady psychological conversation. 
I, I don't I don't know if I want to, how much you need an empathic person in in these major leadership positions. I, I'm not sure. Uh, I was just watching Master and Commander before you guys got here. Did you see that? Did you see that? Is film? that the one with Russell Crowe? Yes. No, we're, never saw it. At oh my god, it's so good. But I was thinking about these very issues about leadership and what's required for it, and he was. Um, narcissistic as hell i would say and, and and would defend that as a necessary feature of what he had to do uh and i'm not sure that's wrong i think that is sort of you, you, there's a reason let's put it this way let me let me put my thinking this way there's a reason chris that humans evolved these characteristics and that they stay amongst us there it has evolutionary purpose it's not just that they're a pain in the ass it's that in certain situations they can be quite useful How's that sound? Well, when you're dealing with the Chinese and uh, the Iranians and uh, you know Russia today and a Brexit and a, um, immigration crisis and an opioid crisis and a healthcare crisis, yes. you really do need to. Uh, you probably need some of these uh, strong. Uh, yeah, I, I'd uh, like people to be able yeah. to take uh, <laughs> positions and to take, not, but to be over by to have an impact i think i would have a problem with that my, my emotions would make me ambivalent i'd have to sort of suppress them and that's not good either well something that always struck me about george w bush was the iraq war and how he maintained his conviction in that idea regardless of the global movement against it and the mass protests against him it has to do with what you just explained i mean you really have to make a decision stick yep. to it and uh, whatever medical term that is that you do i mean it does yep. it takes a superhuman to actually stay uh, somewhat cool under those uh, circumstances well we're talking about hw bush right yeah uh, uh, no, no george w. w bush george right w. George uh w. not hw yeah, george and w. and you know there are rumors reports whatever about his alcoholism and uh, alcoholics make great leaders and survivors is that right that's part of their personality construct i i believe very firmly that's the reason that disease survives if you if you were if we suddenly got surrounded by a bunch of huns the alcoholics are going to help us they're going to get us through it because they that's when their anxiety goes away and they become very oh my gosh they, they're that's they make great fighter pilots and athletes and it's things a, like that yeah no no it's true uh, I'm not saying when they're using they're worthwhile. I'm saying the features, the, the features. genetics of that that personality are very adaptive. Um, here's somebody to Catherine saying, according to Dr. Gray, psychopaths are very prevalent amongst corporate America. That is true. That is that is thought to be true. Um, why don't we? I'm thinking we should take a little break. Yeah, is that what you're saying? Yes, she's saying a break, and then we. Okay, no microphone for our producer uh, Susan Pinsky today, but we will bring in your. We will bring in a Russian operative after the break. We were going to bring in surreptitiously, please. <laughs> we, we, we don't. Want no, your wife. Do. She's the Russian operative. It's Simona Mangiante. 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 Uh, is going to be in here and. Uh, and just by way of intro to her, she is a lawyer. She worked for the president of the EU, president of the European Union, uh, and had some inter interaction with uh, Miss Misfood. Had pronounce the name Miss Mifsud. 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 And uh, that's what got her entangled all, on all this as well. <laughs> we will get into her story and more of your calls. Um, be right back. The CBD industry is still pretty much the wild west when it comes to claims and criticisms. The science is catching up with the industry. We will have clinical science soon enough, and there seems to be an overwhelmingly positive response these days to CBD's efficacy. We've all heard the reports, and luckily our good friends at Social CBD are raising the industry testing standards. They like to say they are test-obsessed. Social CBD works closely with their suppliers and multiple third-party labs to ensure you are getting exactly the package that they say you are getting. High quality CBD with 0, 0.0 THC. And Social CBD wants you to be skeptical. That's why they put a QR and batch code on every package. This allows you to check all the test results for your product, not general testing, the product, the one, the specific batch you bought. And while Social CBD broad spectrum products are available in a range of formulations, each of which is clearly described so you can make an informed decision without all that hype and promises that sound too good to be true. To learn more, go to drdrew.com slash social CBD. That is my website, drdrew.com slash S-O-C-I-A-L-C-B-D. For a limited time, you can save 20% at checkout with the code Dr. Drew. Now let's get back to the show. Needles have increasingly become a part of everyday life. Proper disposal is both difficult and expensive. We have the solution. Simpler, safer, affordable, and fulfills the obligation to protect our environment. 
A single stick with something like this means tracking down the user, it means blood test for the person stuck, it means possibly medication for an extended period of time. Needle sticks are devastating. No more. Incinerate the needle. Needle goes in this port. It's over. Done. Needle gone. We all have loved ones who use needles. Keep their home safe. Medical offices are loaded with sharps. We are using ancient technology to protect our patients, our staff, ourselves. You know what needle sticks do. You know the cost and the devastation psychologically and physically potentially from a needle stick. Eliminate that completely. Stop using ancient technology. Sand MIDI, it will solve your problems. Find out more at needledestructiondevice.com. In your professional opinion, what do you think of these gas station dick pills? At best, a waste of time. At worst, dangerous. What is the worst thing that, that could happen for them? Worst case, you could wind up dead. Do you ever say, hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do something like this. I'm gonna try this. <laughs> I have a microphone. There we go. I'll be joining Nikki Glazer on Thursday on her Sirius FM Sirius radio show. Uh, I think it'll be like noon to two, no, 10 to two uh, Eastern time. So look out for me there. Uh, I'm also very excited about that sand device, that needle destruction device. Please uh, check out, just just Google S-A-N-D-D, needledestructiondevice.com and uh Everyone should have those if you're dealing with needles. It's our privilege to welcome Simona Mangiante in here for now. Um, Hi, nice to nice. join. Thanks for hosting me. Do yeah, thank you family. for coming back. And uh, yes. <laughs> in, in spite of, um, you know, you, I'm sure you put plants and things around our house and microphones and things. Of because, course. I mean, yeah, wherever you go. You need occasion to do that. Yeah, so right. I mean, you fit. Uh, whatever I can. <laughs> and today she is rest. She is uh, worn. You can't see there's also red and blue in her outfit. And she's dressed yes. with the with the Russian military. Russian military. I kind of look like I enter in the role <laughs> and I want to be credible. So. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Practicing my outfit uh, more Sorry. than my accent now. So so <laughs> tell, just, I know we reviewed this last time you were listening. Let's do it again really quickly. You, you were, tell us about your, your career with the EU and then how you got wrapped into this thing. Uh, I used to work for the European Parliament for seven years. Uh, um, the first two years I worked in a committee dealing with the human rights uh, called uh, a civil rights committee. I was a legal advisor, so I was going through all the legislation and make sure that it was uh, in they were implemented all the amendments from the political different parties. Uh, in the last uh, four years of my career at the European Parliament, I worked for President Martin Schulz, a uh, socialist group. Uh, so, uh, and he became the president? Uh, so yes, the president, the president of yeah. European Parliament, yeah. uh, German uh, socialist president. And uh, I uh, represented an office for uh, cases of international child abduction. So uh, went through uh, a lot sure of... Sure you did. Child abduction, a perfect exactly. smokescreen for a Russian <laughs> operative. Yeah, right. <laughs> Trying to get our sympathy. Child and abduction. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> How sweet I am. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you're working so, uh, on international uh, rings that abduct, you know, tra tra international child children are trafficking. It's just uh, sex trafficking. It's horrible. So traveling a lot, yeah. uh, visiting different countries, uh, lobbying in different governments uh, to uh, negotiate uh, uh, in uh, implementation of the Hague Convention uh, on the uh, civil aspect of international child abduction of 1980. So I've been traveling in a lot of countries in the Middle East. And, and you uh, speak several languages, right? I speak five languages. Five languages. Uh, um, uh, but Russian is not one of them. Uh, what? And <laughs> sure, of course it's not one. Ukrainian, though. You speak Ukrainian, uh, right? Duh. 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. So don't speak Russian. Wow, that's a perfect. Of course, you wouldn't speak Russian because if somebody held a gun to your head and you'd start to speak Russian, so the Russians don't want you to speak Russian. So exactly, QED. She's a Russian operative. KGB school should improve their <laughs> their training. They're, they're, yeah, they're there is something funny about it. Uh, uh, among my Christmas present, uh, George <laughs> gave me an ancestry test. <laughs> <laughs> and and what'd you find out? I don't know the results yet. But oh, uh, you I must be you, you must know. reveal it here on this show, please. <laughs> I, will I need to know. Do that. Uh, so because because uh, I was saying you look Eastern European, right? And yes. she's Italian, so called. I mean, there is. I mean, let's be fair about the history of the. the Italian Peninsula. There really is no such thing as Italian, right? It's a bunch exactly. of different little countries. Really, a bunch really. of immigrants came no. through, and f- twelve south. different languages. Yes. And you're down in Sicily. South of Italy. Yeah, like and that's a Naples, different language, uh, right? Down totally. there. Totally. I can yeah. speak Neapolitan fluently. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> right. And uh, when he came to uh, my city lately, he says like nobody looks like you, and it was like okay. <laughs> you said that. <laughs> yeah, she's Russian. What do you? Think? She claims not to speak well, Russian. Apparently, there's a major Ukrainian community in her city over she there. Shouldn't look so. Either. She, she, it's going to be, yeah, Czech, Hungarian, somewhere Sounds in there. And all those languages, that's kind of Hungarian-ish. You know and I, mean? um, <laughs> I have uh, also affinity, personality affinity with people from this uh, region of the world. Which region? Uh, Ukraine, Russia. I have a lot of friends from well, there. Maybe, yeah, I don't know why. I mean, it must be something in genetics. So <laughs> I, I'm, I'm Belarus, I Ukrainian. That's sort of my heritage. And okay, so. Yeah, and you look like one of my people. So <laughs> that's it. That's it. I mean. <laughs> So, hey, I want to uh, point something out. Uh, Josette, thank you for commenting about the needles and animals. Yes, we want to give those devices to people that have animals and are giving uh, diabetic shots and other medication by needle. The, the disposal of needles is all taken care of for you for with this, this device. Um, okay, so now you, there you are, five languages, touring. Uh, your, your, uh, your beard is that you are trafficking, defending traffic children. Sure you are. Uh, and then what happens? And then at one point, I decided to, uh, my contract for the European Union expired. I was a temporary agent, so my contract expired on uh, um, August 2016. And uh, uh, I remember the president of the socialist group at the time. Uh, S- same guy? No, it's a, yes. Uh, introduced me. Who introduced me to Mifsud uh, years and, before? And who was he? Who's Mifsud? Why Mifsud is he in the middle is, of all this? Uh, he's he's introduced a, himself academic, as a professor, isn't he? Yeah. Like, but it doesn't strike as an academic at all. Uh. Uh, he's like a networking person, mm. uh, attending all the political events. I don't know which kind of impression you had of him, but uh, myself, it was. You asking George? Like, yeah. I'd like to know what. What did you think? <laughs> Well, um, clearly the guy was an agent for somebody. I don't know if he was an agent provocateur, as they say, or he was an agent of an agency, or what his exact role was. Would, would, in my it, would case, it be safe to say he was uh, highest bidder, who opened for business? He was open for business, yeah. and and here's something that I found very eerie that we just learned a couple months ago, Can't based, wait. based on uh, uh, Michael General Michael Flynn's own lawyer, that Joseph Mifsud was targeting Michael Flynn before he targeted me. So after that happened, clearly this wasn't a coincidence. I wasn't meeting him re, uh, randomly in Italy the way I did, and uh, he ha- he's a big player in this. Uh, so he, he set up that meeting with you? Yeah, and, and he set up a meeting with General Michael Flynn, too. So Was the meeting with you after the 203s were underway? Much before, much, much before, before, much before, okay. much before, yeah. So here he comes so to you now. He comes to me and he says, look, I have a perfect position for you in London. Uh, there is this uh, beautiful uh, institution called the London Centre for International Law Practice and people like you with your experience in politics and uh, speaking languages uh, would fit perfectly the role, you would advance quickly in your career and uh, you know what, the same day you join, I will make you a director. But, wow, but uh, yes, with seven years experience uh, in a relatively young age uh, you can really go far and I was very happy and excited because I wanted to move to London so <laughs> I said oh, wow I get a, I get my job and once I joined the London Center everything was extremely shady uh, introduced me to this other director Naji Idris and uh, uh, we started actually to uh, get involved in a number of meetings with the uh, people from the Middle East, uh, and uh, my expertise was the European Union. So mm. I was uh, a little confused, uh, and I said to myself, uh, why I am at the table with this Sheikh from uh, Dubai, I mean, <laughs> while I should be uh, probably discussing some policy from the European Parliament. Mm-hmm. And uh, then, we, well, things uh, ended up being very shady. I remember he mentioned to me, George, 
he told me you know we have some Lifted. yes he told me we have said this guy who is uh, around your age and is uh, american and is working uh, now for the president uh, trump campaign and uh, when he comes to london just pretend you like trump <laughs> without <laughs> even questioning either or not i really uh, like them uh, so i remember the very next day mif should uh, mention to me george he reached out to me via linkedin George did yes. or Mifsud? Okay. George. And I said so Mifsud hooked that up? I don't know. <laughs> what hooked that, that up? This is just, uh, I think the stars aligned uh, in the way they did and I just r- sent her an unsolicited. <laughs> but, but were you go- just going through? <sighs> I I don't know. How did you come I, upon her? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I, I guess on LinkedIn, you have those people that, you know, friends you might know. Or, oh, friends of or, friends kind or of Or thing. associates yeah, uh, yeah. worked at a company you might know. And then I saw a beautiful girl on there. And uh, I said, oh, she works at the company. I have a couple of questions about Mifsud. And I could, you know, reach out to her. Maybe so. So let's be, let's, <laughs> let's let's take a – give me the camera again. Take a beat and recognize that, see, what, what George – give me the camera there, guys. Yeah, what George is teaching us is that you can use LinkedIn <laughs> like Tinder. So George invented linked Tinder. LinkedIn <laughs> Tinder. So and it worked. It worked out fine. So it well worked. done. So let's go back to this camera. <laughs> So, uh, and and then did you respond to him? I remember uh, <laughs> look at his picture. Said, "Oh, it's cute." <laughs> Tinder. I said, uh, "You guys did." It's a, did you swipe after? <laughs> you swipe? Like, okay, uh, that's that's oh, cute. It's kind of cute. Your JD uh, is very impressive. You know, your yeah, yeah. MSc at uh, the University of London. You know, it's <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, no, I get it. So we started to talk, and for a few months, until uh, on an occasion of a trip to New York, I finally meet George, and uh, everything happened so quickly, and uh, I didn't know that the FBI was following us probably at the time. <laughs> and, uh, I so, so in their mind, they probably thought, oh, this, is, this Russian operative now is hanging out with... Of uh, the Trump exactly. campaign manager. Yeah, they, they came to me in the first interview. Why didn't they put her in prison? <laughs> they tried. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she told the truth, George. <laughs> That's the problem. You a liar. Yeah. <laughs> well, alleg- well, according to the FBI in their own 302s, they say I didn't lie. I, yeah, so well, then they had to manufacture that I did, oh. uh, you know, by this aggressive uh, arrest and then uh, bankrupting me and not allowing me to have the proper attorney I wanted. Oh, and, my God. And mm. so there are other ways to squeeze somebody into an agreement <laughs> than. Uh, yeah. Well, oh, here's a question for Simona. We're going to get to it straight away here, and this is it pertains exactly what we're talking about. This is Max. Max, go ahead, buddy. Hi, Drew. Thanks for taking my call. By the way, I love your show, and I just wanted to say before I ask Simona the question, it's not that helicopters are inherently dangerous. It's the problem that clients put a lot of pressure on pilots to fly in inclement weather or conditions, yeah. like fog. Yeah. So, so let they educate and me. Wait. So, are you Max? Are you a are you a helicopter pilot? I am not. Okay. However, but, but, I have flown on helicopters, and I'm aware. Yeah. I it, it's exactly what I I was kind of thinking on a not windy sunny day with low no cloud cover. Probably pretty safe to be in a helicopter, right? Well, considering it was Cal- it was Calabasas and it was very foggy, it was foggy. there's a good chance that it had to do. And see, with small rotorcraft, everything is restricted to the human eye as far as what the pilot can see. So if you pair that with inclement weather or conditions, it's a bad situation. And a lot of clients will tell their pilots, no, we need to go. Let's give it a shot. Yeah, I get that. there's not much argument. I, I get that. I get that. And and uh, thank you, because we have lots of aeronautical questions about what happened to him. So thank That's you for, for giving us some info. Uh, of course, we're talking about Kobe Bryant, who, if you are just joining us, he died this morning in a helicopter accident with his daughter. Just... Yeah. Beyond tragic. For his family. My question is for Simona. Hi. How do you keep yourself sane amongst all of the media lunacy involving, you know, George's campaign and, you know, the crazy in laws? <laughs> well, am I sane? The first <laughs> question. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I think this uh, shaked me a lot, and uh, sometimes uh, I mean I'm not uh, perfect. I also have my blow up, as you can are, see. Are you are you a U.S. citizen now? Uh, almost. 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 So you're going for the citizenship. Yes. W- you're Italian citizen. I'm Italian. Do you get to make maintain both or? Yes. Okay. Yes. A- uh, and s- and when you say you know when you're caught up in all this, I mean this is your you, you've not spent a lot of time in this country prior to this, have you? Uh, no, uh, uh, only for a few months for an internship. So here you are, ago. you come here, you're starting to set up your residency here, you get married here, and all this, <laughs> I just, I, I, I'm I, like Max, I don't understand how you're not just, 
furious all yeah, the time. Maybe there was a reason I'm sitting here. Now. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so yeah. Do a little help. therapy with, with uh, <laughs> Simona no, and joking. George. I I think it's it has been extremely challenging. Definitely, uh, my skin uh, became very thick. It's a uh, very uh, difficult uh, uh, jokes apart uh, to adapt to new continent, uh, start a new life, your married life uh, uh, among this pressure. Uh, where uh, I become uh, um, the side target uh, of uh, a major story, definitely uh, bigger than me, in which from uh, a random uh, person working for the EU, I become, uh, in the perception, a uh, Russian agent. And as George said, optics matter. Uh, people think my accent is Russian. People. Uh, I was just going to say that. I was, I was like, sure, you don't speak Russian. <laughs> huh? Sure, Simona. That is not an Italian accent. I don't know what that is, but it's not Italian. <laughs> and we can be so ignorant as Americans, it's incredible. But go, keep going. <laughs> uh, so it's, uh, and also, you know, this pressure coming from uh, any possible side. I have a bunch of articles out there um, uh, also about claims to ICE, uh, to me, in, in the process in which I'm trying to uh, be a citizenship or to, to you know, to, to just uh, make my stay legal in this country following the process. And I have... Uh, people lying to authorities about me. Uh, so uh, this has been extremely tough. And, uh, uh, you know, 2020 is a new decade. Uh, I, I think this had a, a huge impact on my personality. Uh, definitely, I think uh, it made me a little crazy. I'm not saying I oh, stayed good. perfectly well, you, you, you sane. You should have been. Uh, I, I mean, they're hauling your, they arrest him in a big, aggressive scene. I mean, what did you do that day? Uh, I and you're an attorney too. I imagine you just want to take your saber out. I mean, start. I I remember I called the first uh, my my uh, the lawyer I used to train work with in Washington and said like I don't know what's going on, but please uh, you know just uh, check on uh, the situation and trying to uh, be helpful as much as I could to be dragged into that and become myself a target just to help. Imagine how hilarious it is. <laughs> I mean, uh, so I developed a very thick skin. Uh, doesn't matter what people say in the end, you know, like uh, you are who you are and what people say won't change it. And, uh, you know, just try to have, uh, forget about all negativity and uh, go ahead. Uh, whoever likes me, likes me. Whoever doesn't like me, doesn't have place in my life. Max, does that, uh, <laughs> does that get to your the answer? It does. And I had just one more thing to add. I feel her pain, not nearly, of course, in the level that she does, but I am also a blonde-haired, blue-eyed Italian, and I get accused of either being a Russian agent <laughs> or somebody who's German. A Russian agent? So, <laughs> what is wrong with us? <laughs> yes, I do. Well, yes, I do. Uh, well I, now everything's about Russian collusion. The second yeah. you disappear Russian, then instantly you're Russian. So I, I, I am totally Russian, and nobody accused me of being Russian. Russian. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks, Max. Good question, and uh, thank you for the information about the helicopters. Thank you. Bye. Uh, let's. Uh, somebody. The people are wanting to talk a little more. Kobe. Do you? Do you are you bas NBA fans? Or you? Uh, yeah. I, yep. yeah. You, you, uh, you. I. I don't. It's, to me, it's the most exotic. Uh, I mean, I know Michael Jordan since I okay. was a kid, and uh, of <laughs> course, you, I mean, I can. I, I just you have a passing understanding. You know, Kobe yeah. Bryant was an important man. I, I know. The, I know, okay. and uh, I just feel horrified by yeah, it. I know. It's I awful. mean, it just like calls the fragility of life and uh, I am empathetic toward this wife right now. You know, I it's, can't this imagine is what, how this is what she Europeans, can survive to death. Europeans are, tend to get very, and Kristen, I've got you here on, on, on mic, so hold on a second. Europeans get very, um, philosophical is not really the right word, um, but I'm going to say philosophical when it comes to, you know, like you, you just saying it, it gives the fragility of life and yeah. uh, the importance of family. And you, you guys have a, you, it's easy for you to prioritize, I've noticed. Kristen, go ahead. Yeah. Hi. Well, I just want to say that one of my fondest memories of Kobe was in his rookie year when he actually got a foul for not dribbling the ball across the half point line in the amount of time that the NBA allows. Right. And it was such an embarrassing moment for him, but he handled it with such humility and graciousness. He was obviously very embarrassed. For those of us who are all fans of the Lakers and fans of the NBA, we remember that moment. Um, and it was that moment that I fell in love with this human being as a player because he wasn't perfect. Not, he was not, never going to be perfect. He, but I will tell you, he 
asked a lot of himself. He played in Italy for many years, spoke fluent Italian. Oh, uh, and, and yeah, as a young man, uh, that's where he got his career. In, you didn't know that, Susan? He's Italian? What? No, is that, I mean, that's where his father, his father played. Oh, his in father Italy, played. And that's, that's where right. he learned Italian. That's yes. where he learned Italian. Oh, yes. That's right. His, his father, father played, he learned Italian. He also sort of honed some of his skills there because it was during his youth. But that, right. I beg your pardon, and, that's and, correct. And Kobe was fluent. He was fluent in Italian and Spanish yeah. and English. I mean, this was an educated, oh. beautiful man that gave so much to the sport. And today is a, is a tragedy. I know. And I will never forget this day, just like I never forgot the day that Princess Diana died. This is equal to me, and I will mourn this day for the rest of my life. I, I, I don't know that, Kristen, I don't know that it has the same impact throughout the country, but I believe for anyone that has lived in Los Angeles 20 or more years, I absolutely agree with you. I absolutely agree with you. It's, it's one of those things where you, you can't process it. You know, a world without them is like something you can't conceive of. But, yeah, and he was not just an educated <laughs> guy. He was a... He's a brilliant guy. And I assure you, though, although he humbly accepted his uh, his foul for, uh, you know, staying back court too long, uh, believe me, he's the kind of guy that that will not happen again. He, he's that kind of person. He, he right. uh, as, demands a lot right, of himself absolutely. and the, adjust course accordingly. The smirk, the, yes, the smirk on his face. And the embarrassment that he endured because of that initial foul was something that you don't see ever in the NBA. But he committed it, and he took it like a man. Yep. And um, it, and just like a man, he went on to endure a very responsible and positive career um, in the NBA. And he's going to be missed and never forgotten. And, and, and by the way, I can tell you now uh, that hour or so I spent on the phone with him, uh, I heard a lot about some of the things we were talking about, certain personality disorders and distortions and how people perceive. We were talking about Jody Arias, but uh, I got to learn a little bit about what he had been subjected to over the years, and it was not cool, some of the stuff he had to suffer with. Um, but you know, well, I, I don't know the details. I wasn't there, but man, he was like, whoa. You know, he, how, what, what does it mean when X happens and somebody claims Y is what happened? It's just, it was very confusing to him. So thanks, Kristen. Thank you so much, doctor. You got it. Um, are you in this book? Yes. In, in what capacity? Uh, well, first of all, it was an honor that he dedicated the book to me. <laughs> oh. So it's, um. He sent in the back? Here, because, uh, um. You know exactly where I'll find I, it. I, I think it is. Now, if I don't find it, I feel... It's past the, ah, there yeah. it is. <coughs> to my wife, Simona, who has been my rock through this entire saga. I, I get that. It's, you have to have been. Uh, that, I think, summarizes very well what was my role. We didn't have uh, always beautiful time. We always say, you marry somebody through thick and thin, and I started with the thin. So. How, lo <laughs> how long... Uh, but did, did it... <laughs> did, it get, did it galvanize your relationship a little uh, bit? Like bring it together tighter because you had a common enemy you were fighting? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, when, and for, for people who read the book, and uh, you'll see that when we first started dating, my I was at the peak of my life. I really was at a zenith that not many 28-year-olds can have, you mm -hmm. know, where you're just finishing advising two U.S. presidential campaigns. Both members, both campaigns that you advise are now in the administration. One as the president, one as Secretary of HUD, as we mentioned, Ben Carson. How'd that happen? Um, you were, was your training or the right place at the right time? Do you have the right skill set? for I, the? I, I think it was a little bit of the right skills at the right time in the right place. Mm -hmm. And I, I Are you from D.C.? No, I'm from Chicago, actually. Where'd you train? I, well, I studied in Chicago and then I was at, uh, in London. Oh, so yeah, I, I went to grad now. school in London, yeah. And uh, I was planning on, uh, you know, continuing on the PhD route. Um, in what? In uh, economics and international uh, relations. What, any particular discipline of economics? No, just, just uh, quantitative. Just quantitative, yeah. So yeah. that was in, at the LSC, and uh, yeah. all of a sudden I ended up getting a job. Uh, it's the London School of Economics. Yeah, and then I ended up getting a job at the Hudson Institute, as I mentioned. It's a very prominent I, think tank. And uh, <laughs> I get confused between the Hudson and the Hoover and the and the Manhattan. How do I how do I differentiate all these? Well, it's like a university, right? You have the ten top universities. Let's say you have Harvard, yeah. Yale, Princeton. This I, I have trouble anymore knowing which ones are conservative, which ones aren't. Too. I, it seems like every, every 
everything's overlapping a little bit on the academic side, but I may be wrong. I, no, no, well, no. And, and there's libertarian groups out there. there are, Hoover's sort of libertarian, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah. So ba- so you'll have the Cato Institute and the Hoover yeah. Institute, which is based in California, by the way, versus more of the neoconservative think tanks, uh, uh, Hudson Institute, the American Enterprise Institute. And then you have Brookings Institute, which is more of a moderate to left um, uh, you know, I don't want—I don't like the word globalist um, think tank, but you know, those are more the the type of thinking that goes on over there versus the more America first, unilateral approach that uh, the neoconservatives have taken throughout uh, history. So, um, I are, guess are we the, talking about neoconservatives again? Because when I was in college, we talked about neoconservative. Is there a new age of neoconservatism, and what is it? Back then. Uh, Antonio Scalia was a neoconservative, right? It was yeah. sort of a, it was sort of a, a ab- moral absolutism or, or absolute logical systems of uh, principles. That wasn't that neoconservatism thirty years ago. Well, I mean, it, from the judicial point of view, yeah. yeah if you're looking at the legislative uh, branch, then yes. Um, what is it now? More of a myopic, I guess, view. Or it was, like, it was, incl- it was like it was. It, it was it, when I think about it, mathematics, it was like a set, and you couldn't. It was a set with with limits, and and that was it. Like yeah. a, con- a constitutionalist. I yeah. mean, you you just read the constitution, and interpre- that's it. And you don't really interpret yeah. it. You just read it, black and white. It is right. what it is. Right. It's almost like uh, reading the Bible. Versus yes. some denominations will interpret it. Versus others uh, are literalist. Are literalist yes. exactly? Got that, it. That's constitutional probably, literalism. Got it. Absolutely. Yeah. And and so neoconservative now is so neoconservative today would be the interventionist, uh, the people who are who would pound their chest a little bit uh, to flex U.S. military might throughout the world. You don't really need to engage uh, at, from a multi, really? a multilateral approach. Uh, that's exactly why. I mean, I don't consider this administration neoconservative. No, but not if that's but, it. No, no, no. But they're certainly realist. And um, because they are realists, uh, they think that because the U.S. Uh, economy is growing at the pace it is, there's a dwindling uh, sovereign debt crisis uh, continuing in Europe. You really don't need to to uh, depend on these allies anymore, and the U.S. really needs to take care of its own the way it is. And it's working out. Arguably, it's working out brilliantly. Interesting. Let's. Uh, you want to say something? I feel you... Uh, no, I was I was just like uh, saying it's it's incredible how they could uh, in the beginning uh, I was uh, sort of standing uh, against uh, the Trump administration. You you were not a fan. Uh, no, because uh, I didn't like the way they dismissed. Uh, uh, somebody who did a consistent job for them. Like, You're talking about uh, George? Yes. So like they, the fact they distanced really themselves about. from him. Yes, like, uh, I don't want to mention Caputo because it was, you know, I don't even think he had yeah, such a major role, but yeah. uh, uh, I didn't I didn't like the dismissal strategy. Uh, and that's uh, why uh, I was, uh, I mean, uh, what, what I'm trying to say, I was uh, s- really defending um, him for what has been true uh, independently by any partisan uh, Orientation. I mean, mm-hmm. it was uh, not me standing for uh, politics. It was me standing for a principle, and uh, probably my lawyer background. It's mm-hmm. uh, what uh, uh, more than my infatuation for him, because at the time we were dating for. Of course, I was in my peak of um, feelings and involvement, uh, but I really believed in him, and uh, I didn't in like George. what he was. Yes, yeah. and uh, wh- I didn't like what I saw, what uh, the way they were treating him. Yeah, I, 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 w- I could see that. I could see that mm-hmm. it's a much more personal manifestation of the circumstance yes yeah exactly. i could see how you would re- react that way um i'm getting requests for our producer to be ringing in on this too they want to hear both couples uh talking yes yes you yes you need you need a microphone Hi. yeah you need a microphone uh people are saying where is mrs pinsky which which uh, let me just remind everybody that mrs pinsky and i do this daily dose thing where she is always a part of it <laughs> Um, this I, show, I, I want running the board and I, I know I got it. And, and I, I want to address some of the, some of the stuff that's streaming by that I'm seeing, which is that, uh, they want more, more call-ins. Some weeks we will be doing a lot of call-ins and some weeks we will be doing more interview. I've got two great guests today. That's why we're focusing more on their story and the interview. Uh, we have taken a few calls, but, uh, we will probably not be call heavy this show. So I apologize for that. But Mrs. Pinsky, what are you thinking about the story you're hearing here? The story of these two? Yeah. Oh, I just love it. I think it's just, it's such a good, I love how you met on Tinder. That just, <laughs> it's wasn't that. Tinder, it was LinkedIn. Tinder, he just used it like Tinder. <laughs> what, what, no. did we, what did we uh, call it? L- Linder? Yeah. Linder. <laughs> Tin- no, but I mean, I think that's great. Like, <laughs> like you two are a great couple. I think that what Thank you're you doing is, is a service to this community. What would it's happen? Well needed. Ms. Pinsky, what would happen if we, we did go ahead with some sort of political campaign and, you know, who knows what comes at old. you? 
But I'm just saying, something comes at me. <laughs> what are you going to do? Are you going to stand by know. me? Or are you gonna I'm <laughs> learning from Simona. I mean, we have a lot in common. We are both swimmer models. We exactly. both have like a past. It's not like political. Well, she's more political than I am. But, you know, yeah. it's like I'm not worried about that stuff anymore. But um, We're both Eastern European. Yes, we are. <laughs> the both, and I the bet, both sort of I Northern Eastern I bet you're going to have a little European. bit of check in you like as I, well. I, really so. like, <laughs> um, I don't – I mean, I'm – I'm a big fan of these two because you know I keep booking them. So <laughs> thank you. No, we I, are a big I fan really, of you too. I really hope that everything goes well. I want everybody to vote for George. So oh, thank you. Simi Valley is just covered with homeless people. So whatever we. Oh, can Simi, do. Simi Valley is bo- is a chef. Is it chef as yeah, well? Yeah, Sunland, is Sunland, as well? Simi Valley is chef. No, no. Su- su- no. Well, Simi's uh, the twenty fifth. Is that you? Okay, yeah. okay. Mm. But it's not far from. It's chef's close enough. It's, it's, yeah. it's adjacent essentially. Yeah, yeah. So the same yeah, problems, yeah. many and same I, problems. And I think Drew could be a, a really big help for you. You know, without so. having to be in the Congress. Oh yeah, I'll be happy and to help you anyway. We'll we'll I would love. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, let's. I, I give a pretty nasty and talk about homelessness that I, I'm very angry. And I, my, my son watched, I gave it in Sacramento on Tuesday, and he said, uh, slow down. <laughs> <laughs> he just said, slow down. He goes, yeah, I saw you yelling. Slow down. <laughs> so, well, we should be we should be yelling about uh, this issue yes. because uh, everyday Americans are dying by the hundreds uh, uh, due uh, to there, various... Cr- three a day in L.A. County. And we have 100,000. 1,000 a year. What's the number need to be it's before a, our leaders, so-called, do something? Exactly. Too many. We, we, Imagine. Leaders, so called because but, a real leader would would jump in think of if or it's think of the coronavirus we're killing three people a day in los angeles county you don't think there'd be an emergency there would the same thing with we're losing three homeless a day compare that everybody all right calm L- down sweetie. let me talk i get angry see so you want me to <laughs> talk I'm we be love angry. when you get that's so that. i need that type of energy tour. so but i'm offering high energy. you whatever i can give you as promotion to help i want everybody Thank who's you. watching this to please if you're in the right district vote for George Papa, and I'm not going to say it right. Papadopoulos. Papadopoulos. Thank you. And so we uh, know that they're you, supporting. They they have a good team here, and you can get a lot done. And you've had you have experience in politics. Drew has none, and it's I true. have none. But I but I'm very supportive of it, and I'm not a political person. I don't say that. I just I don't offer that up. I'm that not easily. really either. That's the, I don't like politics. And I, I really want to donate to your campaign, by the way. Oh, thank you. And so I don't much. do that very often. That's, That's good. Thank you so much. Yes, There's very few I'm people who, thank you. who get that uh, vote from me, but um, only because I am a political and I'm a I'm a podcast producer and. A wife and mother and mother of triplets. And I imagine wow. that. That's that's something I would like to dig into. <laughs> oh, yeah, we have at it. If you want to ask yeah. questions, I mean, I can give you advice about that. But I yeah, mean, if you have three, three in one time, yes, it's a okay. Yeah, it's good. I can it's do crazy. That. And I have I have kids that are very well read and know a lot more about politics than I do. And my husband's extremely brilliant and could do whatever he wants. I I know that we could raise the money now because we did have so many great. You, you know, calls and phone calls, like personal phone calls, you know, we want to get together, we want to give Drew money, and, and I was worried about that at the beginning for the governorship. But We, we didn't um, want to call our friends and ask for money. That no, but I didn't realize like you were so me. popular, honey. <laughs> yeah, again, that was yeah. that what I was speaking about earlier, that, that um, sort of... Um, I'm, I'm trying to think of the word. It, it's it, it's almost like a, this the vote. We we really uh, have almost a mystical connection to our vote in this country. It's like it's a very when we give our vote to somebody, it's a very meaningful thing to us. And uh, when you hear people talk about it, I, I hadn't I, it it shook it woke me up to to how people feel about. And it. And I'm always confused uh, when I go to the the uh, to the fill out my ballot. I don't know who any of these people are and I don't so, want to just so pick just anybody skip willy nilly. Skip. You can skip. Just well, get the I vote heard that counts. they throw your ballot away. No, 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 no. Mm-hmm. But anyways, I I mean, like I go in when Catherine Barger's you know, up for re Kelly County Supervisor. Or, She's our buddy. or if I want, you know, a certain president She's been on that's this show. not necessarily Democrat because, you know, in California it's pretty much not going to work out if you don't vote. But anyways, and I'm not, I'm not a Republican really, so don't, you know, in this state, you can you can change your party affiliation every thirty seconds if you want to. It's the easiest thing online. You just go, you just literally click, click. And I, I, when I was doing an AM radio show, I did it every day just to make a point that and how was silly, a how silly ago, it is. Democrat. I was independent, then I was green, <laughs> an independent party, and then and Democrat. That's it's beautiful. Like, I think your support because it's uh, it shows that you're focusing on issue more than on the exactly. Color. exactly. I believe exactly. that's really valuable and it really makes me feel even more. You know, your support is even more worthy than somebody who's embracing a color. No, we are we're <laughs> yes. a dino and a rhino. 
We're yeah. drinos. <laughs> We're drinos. And, 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 and a dino? And, uh, <laughs> you're a rhino. I'm a dino. Oh. <laughs> Look, both both parties are being blown up from within today. Yeah, I yeah. Mean, Donald that, Trump, that's my point. They could yeah, certainly reconstitute, and I could certainly glob onto something. But right now, it's it seems senseless to me. Let me just say, uh, I'm there's so a l- moderate that it's just ridiculous. both of us are that way. I mean, I uh, we're interested it. in people. We're interested in the. Do a serving the people, the, what we need here in this kind, part of the country, and we need a lot. Um, let me just say, uh, people are asking a lot about the coronavirus, so I, since we brought that up. Let me just say, coronaviruses, I'm going to give you a two-minute primer. Let's have that camera. Uh, Caleb, can I get another camera over here? Um, a two-minute primer on the coronavirus f- f- once Caleb takes me off the three-shot. And... There we are. So coronavirus is one of a family of viruses that can infect human beings. Adenovirus, Coxsackie, herpes viruses. These are very, very, very common viruses. And the corona, for the most part, is kind of mild. It causes upper respiratory infection, that kind of thing. But a new, more, uh, new, the virus survives by living in humans. And because our immune system, once we learn what the virus is, destroys them completely, they have to adapt and constantly change. That's why every year we have a different flu shot because the flu virus as a survival mechanism, all viruses shift their molecular structure a little bit so our immune system doesn't recognize it. Well, this particular coronavirus came out of animals, and it's virulent. It causes a lot of, at least some cases, it's virulent, and particularly in people over the age of 50. It was people whose immune system wasn't great. They get an adult respiratory distress type syndrome, or if you know there was a Mediterranean, there's all kinds of syndromes like this. Not SARS, it's not like SARS, it, but it's a diffuse, it's almost more like the vaping syndrome, if you want to see what the, the lung effects are. My prediction is, I have a prediction. My prediction is that this virus is here. We now have a few cases, a couple cases in Los Angeles documented. I'm going to predict it's here and widespread and mild. It's not a massively dangerous bug. The reason we will not pick that up is because we don't do the testing on everybody who has a little upper rest or infection. It's too expensive. We can't realistically do that. So we only test the people who have severe illness and it, we need that information and the severe illness in order to save that person's life. I'm going to predict this virus has been around for a while. I'm going to predict it's here with us in a much greater way than we know. My fear, though, is if it gets into the homeless populations, well, that's an immunosuppressed group, and that could really do some damage. So that's my two cents on the coronavirus. Okay. okay. Everybody got that? <clears throat> Enough. I've silenced our guests. See what happens when I go off like that? Dr. Bruce is uh, on the line. Yeah, I see that. So. Uh, let me see if Bruce agrees with me on this, or if Bruce is even... Uh, Dr. Bruce Heishover, buddy. What's going on? Hey, I worked in the ER yesterday. I totally agree with you. And it's shocking the number of patients I saw with influenza A that didn't get immunized. Awful. Awful. Get your flu shots, everybody. So you're like me. You kind of feel like the corona is probably around as a milder virus than, than the, than the, the hysteria is painting. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. But I, on the other hand, who knows what's really going on in China if you're getting the accurate read on the virulent. Right. And just right. like you say, these things, they just shift antigen pattern so quickly, you don't know what you're going to get. Right. But, so what made you call so, in? You want to talk to so George I, I, and I, Simona? Well, here's a question. As you know, I've, I've been rereading uh, Howard Zinn's People's History of America. And, you know, when I first saw that in the 80s, it was like, well, this is a fringe thing, and I, I can't see it going anywhere. I, I flew back from Germany from some guy from the Green Party, and I think he had mentioned it. But it seems like there's such an, an intellectual base. It's, this guy's in, he sort of, it's like a roadmap of what's happened in terms of, uh, you know, having an intellectual base academically that wants to rewrite our history. And it seems like it's, it's a move towards globalism. And actually, some of my Bernie friends recommended I read this to see where we should go. Um, but what? how do we combat, and you know, I'm not a radical right-wing person. It seems like you got Republicans, Democrats, but the far left seems like follow this whole Howard Zinn thing. And I, I'm not the intellectual giants you guys are, but in reading that and looking at, you know, I, then I remember reading uh, Brave New World Revisited when Aldous Huxley was talking about how Hitler uh, mobilized media to to bring misinformation it seems like how if you guys run for office how do you combat the misinformation these people have the control of the media and academics and it seems like if you're if if you say you're for george uh, for trump you're you know you're just a you're just stupid and, and you don't really understand what's really going on so i don't know if that's a, 
uh, an astute. I don't know if I'm no, focusing I, I my question, it. but in reading I think, that, I think you're you're asking it's, you're asking something I ask Adam all the time, which is how do we get out of this? I, I consult his, you know, Bruce right. Adam, uh, Doctor Spaz. We know him from he's it's part of the Adam Corolla Network. Um, uh, Bruce is an ER doctor and addictionologist, friend of mine for many years. How dare you? A- and Adam has a crystal brain, as you know, Bruce, and so I consult it once in a while. Yeah. And that's what I asked him. How do we get out? And he believes he believes that we have turned. He thinks comedy is one of the harbingers of change. And he looks at the Dave Chappelle comedy special and says, that's Chappelle, I was going to say, turned. right. I watched that. Fantastic. Where, turned, where people can say what they're thinking for the first time. And I think people saying what they feel and what they believe is one of the key ingredients. I Personally, I believe we have to also begin revisiting the history of our country. I mean, I, I was talking about it. I, I, I'm fascinated by the history of our federal government. And I was talking about it last week, and somebody pushed back at me and said, why should I, and listen carefully to this, they said, why should I be interested in any beliefs or opinions of somebody that lived in 1776? And I and I did not say, and I wish I had say, there was a guy that lived 2,000 years ago that we seemed to have an interest in what he said. And then an, his name was Jesus, I believe. And then another guy, Muhammad, that we're interested in. Another guy named Moses from 4,000 years ago. It seems to have relevance today. So when people said these things, does not impact on their truth. Would you agree, Bruce? Uh, no, absolutely. But answer my question. But what's going on today is how, I, and I've watched horror with these things with college campuses and thumbs up for ISIS, flipping the bird for the, for the flag. It seems like there's just such a uniform belief and a lot of it. So how do you, how do you guys combat that? And George, you got to talk through into running for office. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Bruce. We'll let, we'll let these guys answer. Well, well I, I think, first of all, I, I'm a Republican and t- I see the virtues of the Republican Party today being more transformative than ever before in modern American history. We see it in the unemployment rates. We see it in social issues that I believe in. We see it in in potential immigration reform, foreign policy, success around the world. But there's a messaging problem, arguably. And I think, as I mentioned earlier, because politics is optics and it's not what you say, it's how you say it, I think if we had a little more uh, cogent, uh, articulate manner to uh, articulate some of these policies to the American people instead of a little... Uh, a little less bombastic, if you will. I think uh, you could really ease uh, people's uh, feelings. You could uh, win over some hearts and minds because um, I'm just talking about myself uh, as just a person with the last name Papadopoulos. Uh, Obviously, I'm an ethnic Greek person, and I could go out and talk to various different uh, people from various backgrounds, and they feel a little more comfortable with me, even though I'm a Republican, versus maybe an older person uh, who represents uh, something from possibly a bygone era that they don't believe in, even though they understand that they're, that the Republican Party's politics and policies um, improve their lives in a much better way. So uh, that's the first thing. And the second thing I really think about the narrative, uh, the construction of a narrative, is if you really want to combat that, you need to be forceful. And uh, I do agree with the president's a more um, uh, confrontational approach to fighting back against uh, being framed the way he was and the way I was. And I believe, uh, you know, I showed that along with my wife or she was going on television, national television, and getting the truth out there, setting the record straight and presenting facts. And at the end of the day, uh, facts will um, overcome any well, misinformation. Hang on. I'm going to push back on what you said, George. You, you started by saying you needed persuasion and you needed a narrative which is separate from the facts these days, unfortunately. So how do we, how do we get it all wrapped up? And let, let's, let's do it this way. How would you persuade and pre- present some facts on, say, our immigration problem? Well, <laughs> what you do, uh, you really, I mean, it's, um, look, let's, uh, optics, okay? Um, it, when you are... See, so I, I, again, you said optics, not facts, right? Which is but, it? But, you don't but, get to but, be but, but You can do both. No, no, you can no, do no, both. You, can, you okay. actually can do both. Okay. And if you have the right representative with the facts on his side to articulate something to people in a calm manner that doesn't scare them. For example, I disagree with Stephen Miller, for example, and the way he goes about his immigration rhetoric to the Trump, uh, uh, with the Trump administration and how he talks to reporters and how he mentions that. I'm sorry, I don't know who he is. Stephen Miller, he, uh, he's a senior White House advisor who, okay. who essentially runs the immigration policy Got of the it. White House. 
Uh, I worked with him on the campaign. I think he's a decent person, but uh, the way he articulates the administration's immigration policy, it's not correct. Even though it makes common sense, it's common sense. It frightens people. Mm. Where you talk about shipping people out on trains and uh, you know locking people mm-hmm. up, even though you might not yeah. really believe it. Yeah. And uh, a lot of people along the border understand that uh, unvetted migration is a very serious economic and security threat. When you talk like that, it, it, uh, it essentially uh, triggers notion of racism. Uh, people. Why don't they uh, focus yeah. on that? I, I wish they'd focus on the citizens, let's say in California. The citizens of California don't get the health care that the undocumented immigrants get. They are on the streets, not in housing. They don't get the tax breaks. They, they, wh- why can't the citizens get the thing that the undocumented workers get? And how unfair that is to the citizens. What, what is, how come they, there's not pitchforks out? When, when somebody, if you come up here in need, I get it, we got to do something, but give them infinity more than the citizens? Because citizens get zero. And the undocumented workers get free health care. How is that fair to the citizens of this state who are paying the taxes? I, 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 and I'm not saying that undocumented workers don't pay taxes. They don't when they get here. They have not at that point yet. We have. The citizens have. That's all I'm saying. They will. I get it. But at that point, when they receive their health care, it's on the citizen's dime and other undocumented workers. There is the issue of fairness, and we see it in Europe, and Simona could probably talk about this better than I can. In Europe, it's exactly what happened, where you had this unvetted immigration process, these open borders that resulted in mass migration movements to Berlin and to to Stockholm, where it really upended the social and economic structure. Tell us about it. Yeah. We have actually this situation in which uh, uh, opening the border uh, meant uh, illimitedly uh, meant uh, to introduce uh, uh, in uh, to, to put on our shoulder and our finances. Uh, mon- did they give free health care to everybody that walked in? And the they wealth, did? Uh, welfare too, and also so that's but that's because. That's the EU, though, that was providing that, right? Was yes. the Italian state doing it? Uh, no, it's the EU. The EU so is doing actually, it. Uh, the now, policies change from member states and okay. uh, Italy and Greece and probably some other country in the not in the best of shape. They don't even implement these European Union policies. Financially, right. Financially. So they can't implement those they policies. They can't implement, even though they should. Uh, so, uh, But we have places like uh, George mentioned, Berlin, Brussels, Stockholm, and all the, let's say, a wealthy uh, country of the European mm-hmm. Union, an amount and possibly France, uh, an amount of people that live on welfare and uh, have access to uh, health care and uh, also additional um, allowance every month by child. So we have these people coming uh, into the country and having many children and having uh, um, but, welfare. But it's, it's, I benefit. understand the conflict. They need to go somewhere. I am deeply worried about where they need to go. How do you do it in a fair and, and humane <sighs> way? I think it's, it's a big a, it's a big question mark, right? All about setting priorities and what you can handle to have for the what you can't. Uh, implementing the policy which uh, uh, allows you to good look good look good to the voters and saying we accept everybody. Uh, that, that seems uh, unrealistic. We can't be all things to all people all the time. We but the Democrat, just the Democrat platform is that today. It's yeah. open borders and free health care. So what does that actually mean? Everybody who crosses the border illegally will get free health care? Yes. And what's the economic and the security question that's a, that is associated with that policy? People don't look at it. And I actually think you do see pushback against those I mean, really stupid uh, ideas that aren't that just don't make practical sense. Whether there's a moral question associated to that's a whole other issue, mm. and that's so. Exa- would you support? Let me ask this: Would yeah. you support limiting? It's like figuring a way to limit uh, undocumented workers coming in and providing them health care. A limited number. I think first and foremost, you need to have a merit-based immigration system. Okay, I mean, Australia has it. Uh, countries oh, Australia in, and Canada too. In Canada by the way. and and right, I think the, the utopia of this Canada. Go up there, anybody. Go up there and yeah. try to work sometime. They shake you down. <laughs> exactly. They shake you down. Going across that border, the bridge to Canada is not a bridge. I assure you. Go do it sometime if you want to work up there. Exactly, and that's what my campaign and I were looking into. We're looking at models that actually work. I mean, these are developed countries. We're not uh, uh, taking uh, ideas from uh, you know some third world country that doesn't work. I mean, these are developed countries that have educated workforces and a system that works. And in many countries and many borders, they have walls. Uh, Israel has a wall. Saudi Arabia has a wall. Iraq has a wall. Greece is building a wall now between Turkey. And you essentially have a maritime wall between North Africa and Southern Europe today. What, 
de facto. So you do need that. And it's not this idea where a wall represents keeping people out versus specific people in. The last time I checked, people can take an airplane and land from any city into whatever capital or airport in the United States, come with the proper documentation, and not work in the shadows. And I speak from the heart about this because my wife, who's sitting right here, is going through this process today where we, after two years of marriage, still don't have her green card. And, uh, you know, we're just now going to the immigration. Uh, Maybe that van I heard drive up is an ice van. <laughs> I'm just saying. It, you know, know. And, if, and, if, and she and she'll speak for herself. I think she wanted to do things legally herself. I, I agree. Uh, legality is important. And then when it comes to ethics, uh, my question is, uh, can we invite people when we have nothing to offer uh, to our own citizens? So it's a matter of priorities. Yeah. So, so it's first a matter our of security. Citizens, then welcome people. Yes. In. And I am that's a reason. I am an immigrant, and I believe uh, America should prioritize its citizens before than me. Okay, uh, so I it's your priority. Right? That's a simple position. I think people can understand that, which is the, if you're going to give health care, citizens first, then welcome, yeah. then the, whatever economic uh, benefits we have, share it with other people that need uh, need. Uh, shelter if they're in the process of yep. becoming legal citizens i, I don't uh, think that uh unvetted migrants should be receiving uh, health care and i also don't really even agree with the sanctuary state uh, policies i mean these are not policies i think are long-term solutions to these issues and um, i think the merit-based immigration system is probably the best way to go you build the wall well, it's so weird to me yeah. the whole the whole I, the whole idea of the border and the wall I the people like are so the confused about it but, but listen if you drive down the five freeway <laughs> here right you're going to eventually as you approach the mexican what do i call it a border you're going to be in a line of cars and a bunch of mexican authorities with machine guns are going to vet your entrance into mexico exactly. and there's a wall that mexico has up with the united states there and it extends to the ocean on one side and it goes i don't know how far the other way so they how, how far one. should it go 50 feet 500 feet 500 miles Clearly, Mexico wants a wall. They enforce it every day. Go try to go to Mexico. So the the weird thinking is what bothers me. It's like, let's either have a border or not have a border. And if we have one, I guess you have to extend the border because those guys with the machine guns on the other but side, on the other side, are telling you there's a border here. Uh, it's it's very strange the way people think about it. It's but incredible. Do we need to build a wall for setting borders? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Simone f f clearly believes no. <laughs> okay. I don't know. I just don't like the symbolism of the world. I have some breaking news about the Kobe helicopter. Okay, please. Oh, let's hear it. So one of the victims was legendary college baseball coach uh, by the name of John Altobelli from Orange Coast College mm. and his wife and daughter. So mm. we knew Horrible. that the, that Kobe's daughter had a friend and the, the parents were with them. So we don't know. That's That's now five. So we know who they are. And just want to let people know. Again, the story just makes me upset every time I hear it. It's very, very sad. And they were on their way to uh, the Thousand Oaks baseball or basketball. basketball camp, and it happened, you know, in Calabasas. So let me take a quick call here. Michelle's been on hold for a long time. Michelle, go ahead. <coughs> Michelle, Hello. Hi there. Hi. How are you? We're good. What's going on? I was just calling to find out if, sorry, hold on, one second. Okay, sorry, I had my headphones on and I couldn't hear you. Okay. Um, I was calling to find out if addiction is triggered by trauma. Trauma, childhood trauma is sort of the rocket fuel behind addiction that usually comes on earlier in life. Uh, later trauma can definitely also trigger addiction. Uh, what, do you, what is it we're talking about here? Um, rape at 14. Okay. Well, that's childhood. And that's childhood sexual abuse. I mean, that's, that's somebody who's not yet an adult. So for sure that causes difficulty. But, but does it trigger addiction or was the addiction already there? Like the, the addiction is a I, genetic, I, not, the gen, it's a, the addiction is a genetic right. potential that's brought out, can be brought out and really brought out by trauma. So what happens with the trauma is they can't regulate their emotions. They start looking outside of themselves for a solution to that. They find their way to drugs. They feel normal for the first time. They'll often say, or okay for the first time and off it goes. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Okay. That's what I was looking for. You got it. There's another weird thing that sometimes people will do after a trauma is they'll reenact the trauma, which is always hard to... Children notoriously reenact it, but even adults can reenact something like a a rape and then magically a couple more follow. It's just crazy how how our brains put us in these situations. No fault of the victim. It's just something that that our brains do to us. Um, I'm going back to the wall a little bit. I I think people are a little... There again, they're so confused. We have a wall already. It's my point, and and if we're going to have a wall, and we have a wall with Canada, they enforce it like crazy. Uh, I, it's just I don't understand why people can't have sort of a rational idea about borders. Why it has to go all one way or all the other. There, we've had these borders for a long time and managed to maintain them, right? Well, because because the left has um, uh, added racial undertones to this policy, which I don't think ever existed um, from the beginning. And uh, whether, if you actually read and listen to candidate Donald Trump when he came down those escalators and he was beginning to speak about the wall that, as you mentioned, already exists in many ways, and illegal immigrants, he was talking about illegal immigrants, unvetted migrants from around the world. He was not saying every single brown person or whatever person crossing a border is a bad rapist or whatever he was saying. He's saying we have to deal with those bad people because some are unvetted. And in order to prevent any of those type of individuals from entering the country that do, that do put a black stain on the good immigrants, we should just build a wall and then have a more stringent approach to migration in but, this country but there you are the narrative they got it's their the narrative. narrative they got it, their narrative and that's it it will not change that's exact. it's it, it was because the narrative that was established it had the racial undertones that it's very hard to remove today but when you talk about the actual policy i agree with you uh it already works that we're already kind of doing yeah it. we're already we're doing always it. sort of every country does that right every country has a border yeah otherwise it's not a country it's symbolism matters though symbolism I, really that's... matters it's all it's about it, like I said, racial undertones and then a wall keeping certain people out. Well, I think that that's the, the, not the what wall, the point was. The ever. wall, though, I think somebody called it a boondoggle. And I think they're kind, I kind of agree with that in the sense that the wall is just this, it's its own narrative. It's this easy symbol mm-hmm. that yep, you, can, a, you can rally around. And I think that's what bothers I, you. It's, I agree with borders. And right. as I said, my policy on migration are pretty far. Uh, I mean, pretty on the right. But I, the, it's not a waste of building a wall. I mean, immigration uh, control of borders doesn't pass through a wall, pass through a number of other procedures that I don't think necessarily requires a wall. That's another angle you can look at. I want to go back, speaking of another angle, we only have a few minutes left. I want to go back to your book. What else is in here that we don't know about this story? Well, a lot of what's in this book um, are... Deep, deep state target. There it is. Okay, go ahead. Yes. And then the mob wife's picture of you up there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did bring my sunglasses. So yeah. I mean, I can, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. We can recreate... Yeah. Uh, yeah. We yeah. Can, oh, yeah. Don't, oh, put it back on. Put it back on. It's too good. It. We love it's it. too much. We can, we can recreate... The, <laughs> and, Thanks. And uh, we we had to get some picture of like some classic film Russian operative and then dress Simona up with that exact outfit and hey, see what we people do. do. That. <laughs> La well, femme Nikita. Yeah. La femme Nikita. Uh, yeah. The one thing in my book that is that you do start to see are are names of individuals who are now involved with this criminal probe that have never been revealed before because clearly the mainstream media never wanted those names to be revealed. But you are starting to slowly see some of the names come out, including from a recent Politico article a couple weeks ago that mentioned one of the uh, spies that was interacting with me. There are a lot more names in there. I address the motives of these individuals and the countries and the agencies behind them in a way that only I can because I lived this story, no one else. And and when is this all going to come out? And, you know, when is this all going to be made public, there's investigations? And I, I mean, is, is it going to be time with the impeachment hearings or... Well, I, I predict that the uh, the impeachment hearings are going to come to a swift halt. I think he's the president's obviously going to be acquitted. Um, I think the case is over. The uh, the Republicans have made a far stronger case uh, simply because the president uh, released a transcript that's at odds with uh, this entire uh, process. And um, uh, other besides that, I think uh, we did see the beginning 
which was the Horowitz investigation. The Horowitz investigation opened a chapter, did not close a chapter, and uh, the Durham probe, which is ongoing today, which is a criminal investigation, is going to close this uh, chapter in this uh, very uh, dark uh, chapter in American history. Is it going history. to be a year from now that we see the details? Six, a month? Six months? What do you think? I can't, pr- I can't predict that. All I can say is that the Attorney General, uh, William Barr, and John Durham have been traveling the world over the last uh, four months, meeting with these particular countries that I detail in my book, some of the operatives that uh, were meeting with me, and trying to figure out who was running them at me and for what purposes. Whether it was nefarious or not, we don't know yet, but uh, we'll find out soon. And, and uh, just you know, in terms of the <laughs> monkeying with our election electronically, which they've done through the Internet, which is a whole different matter, uh, Wanda Sykes the other day said, "Oh, they, they, they as long as they keep using race as the bludgeon, they, they will they will have effect." I think she's right. I think she's right about that. But that's a whole other matter, which is our electronic attack that uh, both I'm imagining, I'm imagining every big country is doing right now to each other. It must be. Uh, and and look, I'm uh, I'm completely for a bipartisan approach to combating election interference because it, it deals with cybersecurity at yeah. this point. Yes, and that's the future of warfare. I don't think uh, we're going to have tanks rolling across borders the way we did. We're going to have espionage and cyber attacks that can cripple oh, a country. You're talking like a you're talking like a spy, George. You seem to know well, something. Maybe, what is what is your wife's spy? Well, may say. Well, what do they say? <laughs> do you want to uh, imagine the future creator or one of those types? <laughs> so, so if you see it, and I think people can predict that that's where we're moving as a as a world, we should address it. And clearly, interfering in foreign governments' elections, whether you're a friend or a foe, is something to me, that they would do. Part of that is going to be the space stuff too which is mm-hmm. the satellite systems yeah. and uh, the fact that people are making fun of that I, I, I think you do that in, in, in great error because the, the whole side if you could knock out everybody's satellites well that's it for the electronic piece that, that the, or the cyber piece that's exactly and right and so to me the space is not about space ships fighting with each other it's about the liability of all these things we use up in space, space to run our economies and the and the, God knows the uh, the clouds and stuff that are up there. Oh my and God! That's I a bet. wild field because there is no regulation yet. Yet, you right. guys, I'm going to wrap things up. It's been a privilege, Simona, to have you here again. Thank, Thank you for you. being here. And George, really great to meet Thank you. you. And nice we'll to meet you too. We're happy to support Thank you, you so any way I possibly can. And and Susan Pinsky is going to uh, you, contribute to your campaign. <laughs> Send you money. Something Thank she has you. never done before. I don't think. Have so, you ever, have you ever have. contributed to a campaign? Yeah. Okay. Catherine Barker. Oh, yeah. Okay, of course. We've done that. Uh, and Mrs. Producer, anything else? I love you. I love you, too. Love you Thank too. you to Caleb Nation, uh, Lindsay, uh, for producing this, and, of course, uh, Susan, Michelle Poe for the set design. <laughs> Lindsay K. Floyd, who's on the phones there with us. I'm sorry Gosh. for people I don't get to on the phones. We will try to do the Daily Dose as much as possible this week. It won't be quite so fancy because I'm going to be on the road in New York. But we'll try to ring yeah, in. Yeah, we got to figure out how to work it out. We're on trying to figure laptop. out how to do that on the road. So we will figure something out. We are not doing the uh, Ask Dr. Drew next Sunday because we're not going to be here, right? Super Bowl. Super, Super Bowl, Bowl Sunday. We're we'll flying you... to Denver to do the Daily Blast. Right. We'll something. give you guys a day off of all that. Um, <laughs> and uh, check out, you know, After Dark uh, with your mom's house. Check out uh, Dr. Drew Podcast, Adam and Dr. Drew. Anything you guys want to plug other than the campaign? Any place that you want to f- uh, give me your Twitter handles? Simona Mangiante. That's uh, M A N G I A N T E. And, and I'm at George Papa 19. And I'm also very happy to announce that I've recently launched my own podcast. Oh, good. Punching Back with George Papadopoulos. And I'd love to have you on as a guest to talk to get into more of uh, this uh, crisis Done. that we're dealing with because I think you are the go-to expert. I would love to pick your brain more about I it. I will go off on it. I'm happy to do so. Thank you. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank, thank you all so for listening much. and participating. We'll see you next time. The strangest call you've ever received on your show. Uh, I'm a caller. I'm not sure you want me to really get into this, but a guy that called and said, you guys are willing to listen to everything, and I want to know why people freak out when they hear about my monogamous, loving relationship. Turns out it was his dog, Brutus, in a Achille Collie mix. And um, he was having relations with it. Yeah, let's talk about something else. I think so. (laughs) 